Steen first joined Saxo Bank at the turn of the century in the year 2000, uh, both as our chief economist and then our CIO, our chief investment officer since 2009. He focuses on delivering asset allocation strategies and analysis of the overall macro view and political landscape as defined by fundamentals, market sentiment and technical developments. Now you'll probably see Steen on a range of different media outlets, in particular over the last few days here uh, in Singapore and through APAC. Uh, so with that, I give you Steen Jakobsen. Thank you, Steen. I like the disco music. That's very good, very telling for a 50-year-old economist from Denmark. I think it's, uh, I have to uh, do a disclaimer. Normally it's about the legal uh, compliance, but uh, I think it's very risky to make the, me the starting point of this conversation. Uh, the risk is that uh, quite a few of you, after I'm finished, will have to seek uh, psychiatric help. Uh, but most importantly, I think uh, my CEO loves to introduce me as Steen Jacobson, uh, the CIO of Saxo Bank. He has predicted, and now you have to hang on because this is an intelligence test, he has predicted five of the last two recessions. It takes a little time even in Singapore to understand the joke. But uh, if you can change to my slides, please. What I want to talk about today is actually uh, the whole conversation about, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a whole conversation about China. So, you know, they wanted me to talk about the inflation being dead. I just want to talk about we have sold out. Because 90% of everyone that ever goes on TV, and, and I think you all know, anybody on TV, you just need to fade, you need to do the opposite, including me. But 90% of everyone that talks about the markets are basing their analysis on aggregate demand. The most irrelevant information there is in the world today is the aggregate demand. Whether there is this and that amount of foot traffic to the housing market or not, doesn't really matter because the fixed in the elastic supply is not going to move one inch when the whole world sees the energy problem one, which is given by the statement that governments are saying listen the reason we have an energy crisis is not that we have too little ESG too much green transformation it's actually it is it does not we have too much sorry it's actually that we have too little EU right now has a green taxonomy which means that you cannot do anything in Europe if you doesn't have a green plan that sits up against the fact that the world, as we see it, is operating at its limit, simply because the physical world is too small for the aspiration of fiscal, monetary, and green transformation as a whole. During the pandemic, we had the biggest transfer of wealth from the public sector to the private sector ever in history. So as I stand in front of you today, I will make the bet that it is more likely that I will get to play for Denmark in the World Cup up front in the attack, then inflation goes to 2% in the next three years. Yes, inflation, headline inflation will come down, but it will not come down to a period of 2 to 3%, but in a period of 3 to 6%. And it will probably start at 6, then 5, then 4, if we ultimately live up to the ultimate premise of the futures market, which is if you need lower prices, you need higher prices. And what are the politicians doing right now? They are just introduced in the UK a price cap on prices on natural gas. What is that going to do? It's going to keep the demand at exactly the same level against the supply side, which is never, ever going to be improved. So that's the good news I have for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Let's move on to the bad news. So if we look at the short term right now, we had the Jackson Hole speech which is remarkable in the sense that it was Powell's pivot on a pivot before he does the next pivot. I've been observing not 25 years, as they say, it's like 10 years old that uh, description they made of me. I've been watching the market for 35 years. I have never seen a central bank governor finish a speech in nine minutes. You know, central bankers is like rock stars. They want to be in the limelight. They want to talk. They want to talk about themselves, how great they are, and how they have not predicted anything ever in history. But nine minutes indicates the Federal Reserve was giving him a mandate to clarify what the objective of the monetary policy in the U.S. is. And that is hawkishness. Hawkishness and more hawkishness. 
So basically what transpired during the Jackson Hole and that what we need to realize is that in a game theory thinking, the Federal Reserve and the global central banks would rather be wrong being too hawkish than being wrong or being too dovish. That is the first time in the last 30 years the Fed has any integrity if they live up to that. Up until now, the last governor with some integrity was Paul Fogger. The reason for this change is clearly that central banks globally, like the Swiss National Bank, is acting correctly, while the Federal Reserve has been hoping that this soft landing was incoming, that we can manage the amount of leverage in society, and we can do this in a slow burn. We are not. So the first conclusion tonight is that the next three months would probably be, for sure, the most volatile part of this down move in the equity and, and the bond market. But I will define it as a three months window of the ultimate hawkishness because the combination of the strongest dollar ever, the QT, the reducing of the Fed balance sheet, coinciding with the most hawkish Federal Reserve and with a little bit of credibility creates the ultimate challenge for the market. Conclusion number two is that the terminal rate needs to move above the 4% that is indicated. The forward projection of interest rate in the US needs to move from a terminal rate and a move into the back end of 23 that indicates that we're going to see rate cuts. The Federal Reserve the next month, I will guarantee you, will make sure that you understand that they have no intention at all to cut interest rate in 23. To that I will say, that guarantees you they will cut interest rate in 23. So what is happening in the world right now is that it is not even relevant where we end on inflation or where we end on the terminal rate. What is going on is that all crises that I live through has been driven by one factor and one factor only, and that is the illiquidity of the market. It is the liquidity incidence that creates the waves which becomes the financial crisis, the one that we act to. So I will say it is, as I indicated, deeply unlikely that we get to a point where inflation comes down enough to create the pivot. It is, however, minimum a 50-50 chance that illiquidity, because of this hawkish window we go into, can create in Q1 a move by the Federal Reserve and global uh, uh, institution to try to relax the monetary policy. Being European, I need to address the energy crisis in Europe. I have met with a number of journalists and, and clients here in Singapore, and you all want to believe that Europe is going down in flames. It's disappearing from the surface of the earth, and there is no fundamental value, value left in Europe. But let's address the elephant in the room. The problem with energy in Europe is very simple. It's a matter of the equation that we use to calculate the electricity prices. So in Europe, all electricity prices, independent of the source of the generation of electricity, is priced on the marginal cost of natural gas. The total average input of natural gas to electricity production in Europe is less than 20%. In my country, it's zero, pretty much. But despite that, everyone is being taxed as if we were all on what is in oil barrel equivalent $450 oil. So what you see on Friday is a disconnect of the pricing mechanism as the first level. That's why we see a mini rally today in bond markets and in the cable and everything else. There is this perception that price caps and trying to freeze the prices in Europe will help. Well, if we go back to what I just talked about in terms of elasticity and net demand, the only thing that really does is to maintain the aggregate demand at an elevated level with no movement on the supply. So it's only a matter of buying a little bit of time. And if we look at the action over the weekend, we come back to what I just talked about, illiquidity. The Swedish government had to put up 23 billion euro dollars, euro, sorry, 23 billion euros to safeguard the electricity producers in Sweden because their margin demand on having derivative contracts in the electricity market became too big for the actual equity capital in the companies. This is a liquidity event. It is like an early trembling of a Lehman moment when all electricity generation needs to be met 
by a market-based margin call, which is then actually guaranteed and funded by governments. It is also, and this is important why Europe is not going down the drain, it is going to be the single biggest fiscal expansion since COVID transfers. Europe right now is busy trying to start up the engines of doing energy and food support throughout the economy for making sure manufacturers is subsidized one way or indirectly, the windfall taxes and everything that's on the table. And also, again, good old Germany in the corner came up with 65 billion euros just on the weekend. This is just a weekend job. On top of that, they're spending 100 billion to increase their defense spending. This is the frugal Germany of Ms. Merkel. I mean, if she was dead, she would have been turning in her grave. She's not dead, fortunately. But she mismanaged the German economy to the extent that they have the worst digital, digital infrastructure in the world. They have the most naive energy policy ever constructed in, 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 in energy uh, anywhere. And they have a political landscape where the Greens, the Green Party, is the most supportive party of not only changes, but also using nuclear power. If you told me that three months ago, I would have said, you are stark raving mad, which you probably are anyway, but not in this circumstance. And then, spending the, the last part of my speech on how do we deal with all this? Well, maybe we should start on this slide, which is probably the single most important, I, I shouldn't take out, Albert probably have something that is more important, but it's the single most important slide for me to watch tonight. Because as I stand here today, the intangible assets in the world is 90% of the total value. Intangible. Intangible means it's not there. It is in your head. It is uh, some concept of what goes on. It's a little bit like our children being in metaverse or asking my crypto analyst, what is really metaverse? And I'm still waiting for the answer. And he's only 21 years old. I expect him to have the answer by now. But this gives us a, a good concept of what needs to happen over the next decade. What needs to happen is that the 90% needs to drop significantly. And when I say significantly, it's 10, 20 percentage point. And the tangible economy, the real economy, the one that is too small to cater for the fiscal, monetary, and green transformation, needs to increase in size, in sourcing of capital, and leaving on the table the biggest opportunity in macro I've seen in the last 20 years. Because you have one group of people, and Ray and I was discussing it. I mean, Bloomberg came out with analysis two years ago. 60% of all assets is going to be ESG compliant. Good luck with that. First of all, let's assume there are $70 trillion worth of wealth in the world. If that's going to be 50% of that, that's $35 trillion that need to be sunk into a pocket that is probably worth, what, $1 trillion in total right now? So the PE needs to go up 35 times in order to actually cater for this. I mean, the naivety by which we are being guided and the principles, for bloody, for Christ's sake, at Saxo, I have to take an ESG course. Why? I know more about ESG than any regulator has ever done because I've actually studied the economics of ESG. There are no E and there are no S and LG. There is an illusion of it, which reminds me of Metaverse again. So the way we go about in Saxo, of course, we are mainly, the main business Saxo is a facilitator of trading for you, for you guys and girls. So the equity team at, in Saxo has created equal weighted basket of themes across the board. I just claimed that the best performing assets should be tangible assets in the real economy. And here's the proof, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the performance here to date. Commodities, 17%, defense spending, 7.3%, Renewable energy, you know, 1.5. India, super story, logistic, minus 8.2. It's remarkable that someone who has a performance of minus 8.2 is actually doing well, but that's the, the new uh, eureka moments of, of investment. But look down here. Crypto, e-commerce, bubble stock, payments, next-gen medicine, semiconductors. Did anyone say ARK Investments? <laughs> and I'm not making fun of, I actually met uh, the CEO and founder of It's a great idea is a conceptually a option on the future being bright and linear and hopefully even exponential. I'm just saying all the themes that was working in the past is working no longer because the physical world is way, way too small. The elasticity of the market is way too big to cater for this. And of course, now I'm going to really risk my, 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 my two cents in doing a call in China. 
So I've been in Singapore for all of two days, and all of a sudden I feel like I'm a China expert because people ask me, people ask me so many questions of China that I have to come up with a story. And this is my story. My story is that you need to respect the fact that the credit impulse in China is already rising. This is squarely against the universal concept that China, like Europe, is about to fall apart because the property sector is 25% of the GDP. But listen, anyone who's ever traded in China knows that the property sector is not going to go under. It's going to be redistributed from other income sources, like the all-time high export sector they have, from a Congress that sits in October. And then probably, if I'm a little bit uh, aggressive here, if you combine the Congress with credit impulse and a little bit of QE, what do you get? You get a Chinese market that's going to outperform relatively because they are in a different part of the cycle relative to the rest of the world. The rest of the world is on a hockey's final window of tightening, the seventh or eighth inning in a baseball game. And for, for those who don't play baseball, there are nine innings uh, in, a, in a baseball game. So we had the end game. Whereas China is only really getting out from underneath of their closing themselves down have an alternative strategy on zero policy and allowing single sectors to be too high a weight. So I personally have an allocation of 3% to China. I have to say, when I come back from Asia this week, unless I hear something uh, over the next couple of days or, or, or if some of you pushes back against me, I think that I would go and go back with Congress plus uh, credit impulse plus QE is a reason to start looking at China, simply because the credit impulse is never wrong. The credit impulse is forecasting accurately 60% of all future growth for the next nine months. It still allows 40% of the growth to be undecided or being negative or coming from different sources. But I think what China needs is either a QE light model to safeguard and recapitalize the banking system and the, uh, and the property sector, all alternative create what we in Europe did in the 1990s with the Swedish bank model. You take all of the bad debt, you securitize it into a guaranteed wealth fund, you issue bonds on that, and then you amortize it over 50 years. Mm. So China is probably not going to be the old China we used to know, but right now the world, especially the Western world, is selling China to the extent that they are so underweight that they are almost overweight in, in, in philosophical terms. So that gets me to my, the end of my conversation here. Number one, we are into a three, four month window of perfect storm environment. QE, dollar strength, and the, uh, and the hawkers that are fed. The inflation will not come down, but liquidity is the real risk. Beneath all this, I think inflation is and was the only equalizer to this whole game. Imagine we didn't have inflation. We will still be rentiers buying real estate at sky-high prices. We will still be allocating money to non-profit uh, businesses in, in startups. We will be having and buying uh, probably lots on the metaverse for uh, billions. We will be buying NFT uh, art for uh, $100,000 a piece. Instead, we have forced through inflation a move toward productivity where the real economy gets engaged. And when you engage the real economy, the funny thing is, it's real people, ladies and gentlemen. It's actually real people. It's not something you meet in the metaverse or in the internet. It's actually people who deal with real issues on a daily basis. So let me say that I am the most optimistic I've been in my 35 years of being an economist. For one reason only, ladies and gentlemen. It simply cannot get any worse. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.